Alright, so welcome to our second session, gamification of fan experiences using XR. Um, we have on the stage here, we have Mrs. Tasha French, who's going to be our host. Um, we have Mr. James Giglio. And lastly, last but not least, we have Mr. Bobby Basham. All right? Um, appreciate it. Well, Natasha, it's all you. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining him, us today. Again, my name is Natasha French. Um, and I'm so excited to be with two of my favorite people in the XR space. I work both with, on James' side, um, helping brands and teams create immersive experiences. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is I'm sure you all remember the days when we had clipboards on the concourse and people tried to get your name and you got a free t-shirt and then the next thing you know, you signed up for a credit card. Well, that's come a long way. And so, you know, now you can holographically pitch baseballs to players or whatnot on concourses. So before we get started, I'm going to introduce James um, and have him give a little bit of information about himself. But I always like to start panels with a fun fact about uh, the speaker, so fun fact for James, and you can ask him about it afterwards, is he once stole an airplane with a buddy to pick up another buddy across the country. Well, I'm still working on my license, you know, it's just, <laughs> this is like a 20-year plan, but thanks, Natasha, for recalling that bad memory uh, uh, from my past. But uh, I'm James Giglio, I'm the founder and CEO of MVP Interactive, as Natasha had mentioned. We are a creative technology company that create immersive, immersive experiences for sports teams, large brands, uh, focused in and around live events. And so we had the, the pleasure of being able to build a host of technologies, both bespoke and working with uh, other integrators and creators here at AWE. And uh, we've been doing that for the best 10 years now. And uh, James is right, um, who is a friend of mine, Bobby Masham, will not only is was he a player, but I think a fun fact about Bobby was he was traded for a runner-up for Dancing with the Stars, so. Wow. Yeah, um, thanks, Natasha. Uh, <laughs> pleasure to be here. My name's uh, Bobby Basham. I'm the director of baseball innovation for the Chicago Cubs. Um, uh, basically, my job is um, to go out and find and potentially invest or partner with uh, technology companies, people, industry, uh, academia, um, and bring things back to the Cubs that help the baseball side and, uh, and our players um, win baseball games. So um, you know, I've known James and Natasha for a while and excited to be up here and uh, be at a new place for me and um, tell you what it's all about. Cool, and it's, I, so how did all three of us end up on this panel is, so um, Bobby and I knew each other from an investor group we both mentor, and the thing I love about Bobby, he always calls me, he goes, Natasha, I have this idea. I would like to bring it to the team. How do we make it happen? So this particular idea that um, he'll talk about and touch on a little bit was how do you use technology, you know, to help the players hit the ball better, right? So what we're going to touch on first, I'm going to have James really touch on working on the teams and the brands and creating the fan experiences. And then Bobby will dive into a little bit more. Part of that fan experience is the players and then winning games. And so what he's using on the technology side to make that a better experience for the fans and the teams. So James, to kind of get started on this, similar to how we all got here today, for someone, a team, a league, a technology company, where does one start when exploring integrated immersive technologies to engage with fans? Sure. Well, step one is always call MVP Interactive first. <laughs> Let's just get that out of the way. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, we really take a, a, a five-point plan in terms of um, focusing on the discovery and the needs and the goals of the particular client, whether that be a team, a brand, an agency, or anyone in between. And so, um, you know, I'm just going to reference a project that we had uh, deployed this past year with the Columbus Blue Jackets, um, mainly because it really showed a, a holistic approach on how we were able to uh, renovate concourse space and create an immersive fan experience right there uh, at the stadium at Nationwide Arena. And so the team came to us essentially with a couple of key pillars or, or guidelines that they wanted to communicate, uh, not only through technology, but whatever the team and the brand message was. So I think that's very important when during this discovery process, you, you really understand the values and what the overall message the, the brand is looking to communicate, and then leveraging technology to tell that story. Because what we found in particular with fan experience technology is 
Natasha's antiquated description of how brands communicated with consumers in the past was, was full of friction, right? You know, you were soliciting, you were yard barking, you were trying to get something out of someone, an exchange of information for a fairly poor tchotchke. But now with technology, as you see here with maybe even the Snapchat kiosks or some of the, uh, the head-up displays, where when you allow users and consumers an immersive experience or something that they wouldn't normally have access to, it breaks down that, that friction of the communication and it really creates the affinity. And so uh, when the team approached us, uh, we essentially wanted to cover off on how technology could lever leverage that communication and that frictionless experience. The second thing was that they were really into this community message of what's called sticks in hands. Right, so their outreach program was about how they can get youth hockey more involved, or how the club could get more involved with youth hockey. Uh, so they wanted concepts that focused in and around the physical sticks and hands. Uh, so then, of course, as a creative technologist, you, you really start thinking about embedded software, hardware, what, what we can do in terms of um, creating these experiences. And so immediately what came to mind was, you know, top golf for hockey, right? Being able to create, recreate puck shooters or do slap shots with high rate sensors and such. And so that's essentially what we, we ended up rolling out and deploying because of uh, that tactical experience or at least messaging that the team wanted to focus in. Uh, the other thing, uh, key pillar that they wanted to focus on was esports. And so uh, CBJ is one of few major league um, franchises that have a gaming organization called CBJ Gaming. And so they wanted, again, to create this community outreach, whether it was Ohio State Gaming or other um, just general gamers, uh, to create a, a LAN event at the stadium. And so what we did was fabricate a um, replica locker room. So the fans sort of got this lifelike sense of what it's like to be in the locker room, but rather than equipment, we installed seven esports stations. So uh, the space is about 3,000 square foot feet, so it can house uh, these games during um, off events and uh, these LAN events, as well as run the interactives as well. So, and then you kind of go into designing the applications, the, the full integration and deployment, and then data. You know, data is a key uh, part in any interaction that we look to accomplish, and so developing registration QR sites that fans can, in advance of attending the game, can register to participate in any of these events was a, was a key uh, mechanism in, in sort of unfolding this. And, um, you know, we've seen great success with it, as, as well as the valuable data piece where the team can now leverage their, you know, their initial capital expense investment to say, hey, this was really valuable because been, you know, over the course of 15 or 20 games, we registered over 7,000 new users and new fans, then you know, port those into the CRM where they can get a real holistic um, touch point of what type of fan this is. You know, are they season ticket holders? You know, what their concession spends are. And this is all focused in around a destination point in the stadium. And so leveraging technology is a very powerful tool for, for many brands that just goes well beyond just that experience. Um, you know, so I think the most important thing is everyone wants to build cool stuff and you know, have the latest and greatest, but you know, making sure that you take a holistic approach of what the brand needs and goals are is paramount to where you go with the technology and what the final offering is. Thank you, and I know, um, so Bobby, on your end, you know, your team looks at immersive technology and to help build a better fan experience, I think, what are the challenges for playing a 3D sport and how do you recreate that using technology? Yeah, no, um, so, um, you know, baseball, it's, it's um, we're, we're very lucky that there's a lot of data in our game. There are a lot of discrete events and we can, um, you know, we've, we've been able to collect and measure and, and make decisions off of, um, of things that other sports don't have the luxury of happening. But the, the one thing that is a real challenge for our players is this three, interaction between like the bat and the ball or even you know strike zone control etc um, we've had VR in our game for quite a long time there have been a couple of really solid companies um, you know when when VR is, is since sort of controlled the market it's now advertising to the masses but even though that's a good product, the, the virtual world doesn't give our players this like haptic feedback or the experience of like hitting a baseball or, or even just um, you know the the immersive environment of 
um, seeing the depth of the picture and your eyes processing the same information. So what we're trying to create, um, we have these labs and uh, you know, it's, it's fortunate I get to be in an audience like this. Usually I have to be a little careful, but not a lot of you guys are probably on the baseball or team side, um, but most teams have these labs where we're trying to create these environments where we can really dig in and make players better and they get a lot of different feedback on like how their swing looks or how the ball's moving and then try to like gradually train them to, to do the, what we think are, are things that will help them get better. Um, and the one area we haven't, like we, we, we have information, but we really haven't solved many of the problems is just the way the brain processes the ball and their thoughts about, you know, if, if you know much about baseball, you've probably heard that it should be physically impossible for your brain to like hit a baseball going 90 miles per hour, yet a lot of people hit, you know, there's not enough time for you to process the information and react. And, you know, in the big leagues, guys throw upwards of 100, guys hit those pitches, and some of the theories behind this are even some of the physical cues of the pitcher that like the players are picking up bits of information and shapes and hand positions, things that we can't even measure. So we think it's, we're trying to get to this point where we can create a realistic environment and then show them how they miss the ball or timing or where that ball is in space in order for them to correct like their swing or their decisions on swinging. And right now, really the only way we have to do that is uh, in a 2D environment. So we have screens, like picture a guy, he's, you know, we have these advanced pitching machines now, which is another story. Um, you know, they're taking very targeted uh, pitches and trying to improve, like, all right, I'm, this is a high fastball, you struggle here, and we're feeding these guys over and over, and then we have big screens to the side, and it's showing them, you know, their results, or where this pitch was, or even their swing. But that's still displayed in 2D, and if you just picture this interaction, it, this is happening in space, so, and it's happening very quickly. So if you're early or you're late or you're under it or over it, or even your, your swing could be on time, but swings have an arc, where is your arc in that? And, our, and our, our real theory is like if we can show our players that, maybe they can make quicker adjustments, that matters a lot, and we can win more baseball games. So right now we've been, you know, honestly, we've been talking to MVP for, like we know how to create this, like the 2D visual and even the 3D data is available. We know how to like recreate that, but the display technology, whether it's AR, you know, we've looked into holograms and now these new like 3D um, TVs are interesting. We're trying to come up with some sort of product where our players can get this instant feedback. Um, and so it's been exciting, it's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, we're not there yet, and you know, what I'd like to ask this audience is if you have any solutions, like we're trying to create something from scratch, sort of bespoke, like probably not a big market for this product, we don't care, we, you know, it's all about making our players better and, and trying to have like a little bit of a competitive advantage. So, you know, it's, it's fun to be here and walk around the floor and you know, see if there's something that fits and try a couple things out in the upcoming year and see if we can really, yeah. you know, do something special. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a personal passion as well to kind of get involved in the sports science, leveraging technology. And so I think when this sort of challenge was presented to us, um, the unique thing is some of our consumer facing products or developments and even hardware or methodologies really fell in line to sort of how we could whiteboard, you know, solving this problem. Um, you know, I had referenced the top golf. Top Golf meets hockey, leveraging OptiTrack sensors that are capturing at 250 frames per second, and you know immediately thinking about the power of that and, and a, of the baseball pitch and getting in that data, and then even building that, recreating that data into a gaming engine or some visual that would accomplish that that 3D environment is is really fascinating. Um, you know, there's strategies and methodologies that we feel very confident and comfortable with, but taking it a step further too to avoid that 2D engagement with the player, seeing it on a flat surface, is the next hurdle to kind of come over, uh, to get over. And so it's been neat to walk the floor and take a look at some of these 3D displays or holographic displays that 
that maybe could accomplish to a degree at where technology is right now. <laughs> um, maybe the team out here is working on something in stealth that we, we could discover at the next AOE, AWE. But um, so yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating project. And, and again, it kind of goes back to problem, solution, technology, how uh, this is a little bit more unique from a fan experience, but you know, really drilling down on what the, the pain points are for the client and then you know, getting to the expertise of the technology to, to, to kind of solve that problem. Yeah, and if you, if, you, if you can recreate a major league environment and scale that across the US, you talked about the top cough example. Um, you know, I have little kids, you know, I now live in California where people play a lot of baseball, um, but I also grew up in, in, a, in a really small town. Um, if you can create these virtual environments and measure people across the country and really across the world against the same talent, you eliminate some of the barriers that are troubling baseball, right? It's pretty expensive to play. People are traveling everywhere. Like, you know, not everyone has the money or even quite frankly the time to do that. And so baseball's probably losing a lot of talent to other sports. You know, it's a problem. So if you can create these virtual environments, have people train against the same competition from early levels, the high school level, you know, some of this AR, VR, and even augmented reality, this mixed reality where, you know, if we can combine robots with realistic visuals, we already have the pitch data from, you know, you can take Max Scherzer and line him up in rural Virginia where I'm from, see what those guys do against this, then I feel like you can, I don't know, help a lot of people and, you know, unearth some talent and even just rekindle, like, passion for the game, for a sport that, um, you know, probably needs to get with the times. It's getting there, you know, the speed, the pitch count or the speed. Yeah, um, we're trying. We're doing a lot of things. Are yeah. <laughs> Theo, Theo's up there making rules, so we're trying yeah. some stuff. Yeah. And with that, um, you know, we talked, we went from, like, the fan experience, how we're using that technology for the players, but kind of going back to the fan experience, James, I would say using the data piece and creating these fan experiences. I think one of the biggest things I've seen is failures. Like, so about six, seven years ago, I actually worked with the Cubs and we created a holographic experience where we three captured um, one of the players and you, you yourself were a hologram on the display and you can pitch, virtually pitch him a ball and then he hit it into an Aquafina bottle because it was a sponsorship. You know, that has come a long way where we're now tracking the data, collecting data, and that's a lot of times what the brands and teams are looking for. How do you use that data, or how are you working with teams to help brands really engage with fans and make it more authentic when mm -hmm. you're creating these experiences instead of just here's a Trotsky for doing the experience? Right, right. Well, there's a couple things. I, I, at first, I thought you were heading down a, like a, a data when it came to performance and like building out the games. But in terms of the consumer data, um, I think a good strategy for us right now where brands are underwriting and investing in this technology is to create that frictionless in exchange of information. And so we talked about technology accomplishing that. But how? I think the emergence of the QR, re-emergence of the QR code has oddly done a lot of brands a lot of favors, and even from a consumer base, where our normal day, daily living is now back in, in the fold of using QR codes. And so when you're in the parking lot or you're at the concession stands um, looking for an engagement or looking for some piece of information to scan a QR code, which then opens up a, a landing page of, hey, you know, in section 124, you get to participate in this immersive experience. Can we have your name and phone number? And you know, here's here's a little bit of um, information that we we'd like to um, to gather. And you know, of course, there's no objection to it, uh, just because of the fascination of the destination and the experience. And so, um, so be, being able to create those touch points, whether on a touch screen or on uh, on a on a, a separate site. Um, has been tremendously helpful for the brands to sort of see somewhat of an ROI or performance as a KPI to the engagements. And so, as mentioned earlier, you know, we're able to house this on a dashboard that integrates you know, um, anonymous analytics as well. So when we have our footprints or installations, we're running facial detection analytics that is picking up key demographic information like gender, age grouping. Uh, we're tracking eyeballs. We're not tracking individuals' names and you know associating them with a, a name and a face. Uh, that would be illegal, and <laughs> we're, we're not looking to do that. But we are able to show real media impressions, 
when you log into the dashboard and say, wow, you know, we had you know, 30,000 opportunities to see, meaning 30,000 people that we were able to register their facial dynamics, and then over a three-second period of time, we caught them viewing the said area of interaction. And so when you have dwell times over 60 seconds, because whether they're participating in the activity or watching their family member, it's still a media impression, right? And so when we compile that data and present it to a brand, Again, when you talk about some marketers really focused on ROI and you know, cost of engagement, and, and we're now seeing a trend because of the information that we submit, it's throughput. That's the, the key metric for a lot of brands right now is getting throughput. And then using that information, like, okay, how do we make games faster? How do we make that interaction or that exchange faster um, is all a part of our development plans, right? So I think being able to, again, just look, being able to present the data in a digestible format is, has been really important and, you know, the brand can do and remarket as much as they'd like to once they have that information and, you know, we, we're kind of on to the next and um, so that's, that's the approach that we take. You know, and I, I, we're short on time for more questions on my end, so I'd love to open up to the audience to make sure you guys have a chance to... That was fast. That was oh. fast. And I believe there's a microphone. I can't see much, so I'll leave it. <laughs> So I'll give you guys a second to kind of get your gather your thoughts and get any questions for our panelists. First, let's give them a round of applause. Thanks, guys. Um, so I'm hearing a lot of information or talk about harvesting more stuff from the fans, but part of this presentation was I think supposed to be about how do you do how do you create personalized experiences how do you pull the fan deeper into sort of a, a partnership opportunity with the brands can you comment about your any experiments with like nfts of restructuring the fan experience from just a consumer perspective to more of sort of a co-ownership or participatory perspective mm -hmm. As far as NFT goes, I mean, we've developed on some projects that we were hired to produce uh, this general concept of interactive trading cards. Um, we were essentially the back-end development for that startup and for that, you know, um, their launch point, which we were able to accomplish, but I unfortunately don't have the data or the use case of the performance of that product, and I think it's still sort of developing from a business perspective. But when we talk about personalization to the fan and the team, you know, there's been an augmented reality development that we've built multiple times with this pose with your favorite athlete um, experience. And so um, being able to go through the roster of the team, choose which player you would like to, to pose with, take that photo through augmented reality and, and sort of share it, download it. That's probably one of, been, one of the, been the most repeatable personal sort of connection or affinity with the team and, and a fan because of you know, the passion points of um, your favorite players. I don't know if you guys are doing anything in the NFT space or... Uh. No, I, I, the only um, thing that's like sort of changed in professionals where I think like the top shot in the NBA did extremely well where you're you're able to you know trade moments and little snapshots of your favorite player and um and, and really own that experience and i think a lot of people are trying to recreate that across different leagues and in, in a proper way and even just you know with with the blockchain exchange ticketing giving your like a unique ownership to like your seat your experience finding ways to connect to like that seat in the ballpark, and now because of the blockchain, you can, um, you know, you can have some sort of long-term identifiable connection mm -hmm. to that one moment in time and seat that's like uniquely your own and yeah. um, what happened in that game. So I think I think certainly our marketing department has thought about that a lot. Um, the different leagues do things different ways, and you know, MLB does have like a very centralized presence and there's a little less ability to do things on the, I guess, like outside of area. Um, but, um, you know, everyone's trying to think about how to, um, you know, make that, that individual experience and certainly 
blockchain and NFTs like help in that sense. All right, and we'll do one more question. Do you think volumetric capture would help with player training and simulations in the future? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, I mean, I have a host of problems. One, um, like we have markerless motion capture systems in pretty much every stadium in Major League Baseball and across the minor leagues. A ton of research. You know, we've had that for eight years. We have 10 PhDs working on that data. We've got some really cool insights, and different teams have their own unique insights, and we use this in different ways. But one thing about those models are they're sticks, right? Um, limbs, like this changes the physics, depending on how my arm is. Like if you were going to build a perfect pitcher, he'd have big old legs, tiny waist, and long, skinny arms, because that's just, you know, like the perfect model. Um, so like we've thought about it would be great to roll up to a high school game and be able to measure that stuff. Uh, and, and it's not, um, you know, the game now is how can I make this guy better? And what you're looking for are, and it's usually unique to each team, it's like what are we good at improving? And if we feel like we're, oh, this guy, we can add mass here or we can add explosiveness or whatever, like it, that, just, that stuff just improves our our models, right? And even if you know you're talking about creating this virtual world or this virtual picture, if we could create some sort of hologram instead of like a 2D picture, especially for our like pitching robots, um, volumetric capture would be huge. Because right now it's just single camera we put behind home plate, measure in 2D. But yeah. All right, and that's all the time we have today, y'all. Um, thanks for attending the gamification of fan experience and using XR, and let's please give it up for our panelists.